First off, SI session today uh, can't happen for two reasons. One, we don't have a room yet. Two, um, Amelia is off being good at things somewhere and is not in town. And uh, sessions will start on uh, Sunday with Strav's session at 6 o'clock in Wade Tutoring Room. Uh, as we find out our room assignments, you will find out our room assignments. They'll probably come after drop ad, so I'm assuming over the weekend and or Monday we will start getting room assignments. And just as I plugged last week, I would like to encourage you all to rush, uh, all of the females in the room particularly, to engage in formal recruitment. Uh, because it is a good experience and you meet some nice people. So if you have any questions, feel free to talk to any sorority woman on campus. I am glad none of you are paying attention. Have fun learning. Right, are we set? As promised, I would like to outline for you a little bit, not in exquisite detail, that will come Friday, uh, but a little more guidance as to what your term paper is and will be. Yes, it will be a collaborative paper. No fewer than three individuals on your team and no more than five. The paper will be due the Friday before spring break at 5 o'clock p.m. And the topic is of your own choosing. I know I hate it when you do that, isn't it? Here, is, here are the parameters of the topic. You need to find a newspaper article from the last six months on any topic you would like. I would recommend the Sacramento Bee, the New York Times Tuesday edition, which is the Science Times. It can be the Cleveland Plain Dealer if you can find anything. Uh, or any other newspaper that you like. The, the, the New York Times Tuesday edition and the uh, Sacramento Bee are two very good science related uh, sources. Once you have identified that paper, that newspaper article, you then need to find a scholarly journal article related to that topic. That will be a little tougher, but if you haven't found Google Scholar yet, Google Scholar works very well for that. JSTOR. Hmm? JSTOR. JSTOR is another location you can go to that's, uh, that has all of these. You will probably have to go through an interlibrary loan or go to the library and ask them to acquire that uh, a journal article for you. Uh, the university has, has uh, site licenses for many of them, so it shouldn't be ver difficult to get a copy of it. And then a third article that hopefully will give you a little more background information. A review article would be great if you could find it. Um, as an example, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry this year was given to uh, Gerhard Ertel from Germany for his work on the reaction of nitrogen plus hydrogen to make ammonia. Uh, a nice simple reaction that we have already talked about a little bit in this class and that we will be talking about more in this class as the year goes on. And it's, it's really interesting in my mind, geek kind of thing that I like, in that this is the third Nobel Prize for that one chemical reaction. It's insane to think that one simple reaction that we talk about in general chemistry could earn three different people Nobel Prizes, but this one has. So you could read the Nobel.se website, which has a wonderful synopsis for the scientifically literate public and for the general public about that reaction. You could then go and pull one of Gerhard Ertel's uh, scientific papers, which yes, you will probably have to pull a couple to find one that you can read enough of to understand. Um, and they're not all ver impossible to read, they are very readable. And you could get a newspaper clipping that says, hey, this guy won the Nobel Prize. Um, and so there's a very simple topic that you could pick where you could pull all three of these. What you then write will be up to you. A, I don't want book reports. I mean, yes, you have to give me some synopsis of what happened, but a lot of it is, what does this mean to you and to your life as an individual and as a student studying chemistry? And the reason why you're doing it as a group is this specific challenge, and if you read the discussion board, you'll see that I have put a forth a lengthy response recently, of putting together with one voice the work of multiple people. 
Yes, I realize that that is a challenge. It's very easy to say, okay, you write this, you write this, you write this, and then we'll put them together as a paper, but it looks like he wrote this, she wrote this, and she wrote that. Your challenge is to take those three pieces and craft it into one voice. That's not easy. I know that, especially if there's four or five. But as I give you a, um, the most recent discussion board posting, Let's see if I can pull this up quickly. Laptop, blank screen, I don't need that. Is there anything up there? No. Is there anything on my screen? No. Well, that's not good. Now I'll see if there's anything up there. <laughs> Jeez, my computer's choking on me. I'm going to give you a, a, a source of information. All right, where'd you go? There, it's here, why isn't it there? There we go. It sounds like it's there now. All right, as you can see, this column here is the number of unread articles. I don't have any unread articles. I do actually read all of these. So thank you, Caitlin, for starting this dialogue. If I go to my response here. First of all, the, the comment prior to this was the co was, um, uh, and uh, Caitlin, excuse me for picking on you, but you said it, um, that scientists don't grade grammar. Yes, I will grade your grammar. I happen to be a uh, freelance writer on the side, so I think I write somewhat well. Um, and so yes, I will be looking at your style and your voice and your grammar and all those other things that you learn about in stages. Um, so don't assume that I won't be. Second, here's a great source of information for you of a way to write these. The Supreme Court decisions. They're somewhat fun to read, actually. Go pull the Supreme Court decisions from any year. For those of you who are interested, the Roe v. Wade one from yesterday, from several years ago, is an atrocious piece of law, but it's a great piece of writing. And it's not that I disagree or agree with the decision, it's just why they did it was stupid. But um, go read any Supreme Court decision and you've got nine authors of every single Supreme Court decision. And how do they handle dissent? Because there is likely to be dissent. They, they can be very en enjoyable. Read Brown versus Board of Education as a great example of how to write a piece of, uh, of literature, actually, that half the court said, you're full of you know what, and the other half said, we may be full of it, but guess what? We can't tolerate this. Um, you can, there are lots of examples of excellent pieces of writing there, and they show you a way to do it where you may have to put into writing the opinions of nine people, and all nine might be different. They've done a great job in some of those. Um, and so those of you who may know attorneys or be the offspring of attorneys, you go home and say, hey, dad, or mom, or Uncle Joe, or whomever, do you know any good Supreme Court decisions I should read? You know what, they would start, what class is this for? Chemistry, what are you, crazy? Um, there is some great stuff in there to give you examples of how you can accomplish this. I know this is not an easy task. It is also optional, as are the four tests in the final exam. You can still get an A in this class without doing the assignment. How long does it have to be? You know, that's such a terrible question. That's all right, but I knew it was coming, and I sat here and I agonized, okay, when it gets asked, because it will get asked, and you know that the, the cop-out answer is make it as long as you want to. Use as many words as you need to to accomplish your goal. I mean, that's a cop-out answer. 
You know what, if I say that, and I'm not going to, I'm going to give you a page limit. If I say that, I will get some of you writing me three-page papers. Three-page paper, papers, hopefully by now, are a finger exercise. I will get at least one 60-page paper. Yeah, there are some people out there who would say, hey, I'm getting into this, boom, 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 you're gonna pay for this one, sucker. Um, <laughs> I want it between five and 10 pages. So five and 10 pages, my, when I told my wife this, she said, five and 10 eight pages, God, that's about three hours worth of work. Maybe for her it is. You had another question? It has to be about science. You know what, that's a pretty broad field. I'll tell you the last time I studied biology though, so this is where you can all try to say, okay, we're gonna put one over on him now. None of you were born the last time I studied biology. I can almost safely say that. It was 1974, when the last time I had a biology class. So I never took biology in college. Never had any interest in it. Question over here. Um, yeah, um, what, about formatting? what about formatting? You know, all those details I'll put into the specific guidelines that I'll post to Blackboard. Um, what I'm, we're gonna use the ACS style guide, and everybody's gonna say, what the heck is the ACS style guide? Um, it's basically MLA. So my bottom line on references, folks, is I don't care if there's a comma or a period or a semicolon or whatever it's supposed to be, be consistent. Make it so that if I want to look up your reference, I can do it and get the same reference that you're, you're indicating for me. Whether you do it in exactly the right structure, I'm not gonna be too concerned about. As long as I can find it should I want to, and there are times when I will want to, um, then make it so that I can find it. Literature or er, web searches are fine. You can reference the web. There's ways to do that. Can you use the BBC as a news source? It can be any mass marketed news outlet, yes. So if it's Newsweek magazine, Time magazine, something that occur happens on a regular, not a monthly magazine. Monthly magazines are not news magazines. Make it a weekly at minimum, a daily preferred, the BBC an hourly, okay? Okay. Yes, sir. Does it have to be a strictly, strictly a chemistry article? Or no, it can be any science-related article. So it's up to you to decide what that means. I mean, I enjoy reading these. While you guys are off relaxing somewhere sunny, hopefully, during that week, I'm going to be reading papers. I know. So what? If I don't want to read them, don't assign them, right? I know. I know. All right. So I will be post. The other thing I'll tell you, by the way, by Monday, I need the weekend. I was hoping to have it done by Friday, but by Monday, you will have my grading rubric too. So you're going to see how I'm going to assess your paper. I'm not going to make you walk in blind saying I have no idea what he wants. You will have the complete grading rubric there so you can check things off as you go. Like homework, I expect the average grade on these to be somewhere above 90. So I don't anticipate these being like some test with a 62 average. So, not that we've ever had a test with a 62 average. There is an actual date that they're due? Friday, February, or January, March, March? Seven. That's right, the week before my birthday. They're my birthday present, folks. Think of it that way. Current news article. All right. Back to some phase diagram stuff. This is the picture for water, or this is a picture of the pressure versus temperature phase diagram of water. I didn't even look to see if this was in the right units. It's in TOR, that's okay. Every phase diagram for any pure compound is going to look basically like this. There's a solid phase, a liquid phase, and a gaseous phase. There is a triple point, 
where all three phases are in equilibrium, there is a point or there is a line of equilibrium between the solid and the vapor. There is a line of equilibrium between the solid and the liquid and there is a line of equilibrium between the liquid and the gas or vapor. The difference between a gas and a vapor, by the way, a vapor is a compound that in its gaseous state that is a liquid at room temperature and pressure. So water is a vapor but oxygen is a gas because ga oxygen is, a, is a, a gaseous state at room temperature and pressure. The equilibrium that exists between phases as we studied thermodynamics, the energy to transition from one phase to the next is equivalent and opposite. In other words, if I want to go from a solid to a liquid, I have to put energy in. I have to take that solid material which is densely packed, put energy in and separate the atoms or molecules from each other. If I want to go the other direction, I have to take energy out. And the amount of energy I have to take out is exactly the same amount. So the phase transition from solid to liquid requires a certain amount of energy and from liquid to solid requires exactly the same energy but opposite sign. The same is true for the transition from a liquid to a gas or from a gas to a liquid. The third one of a solid to a gas is nice and this was actually an exam question in, in Chem 111 last semester. is if I go from solid to gas, the amount of energy I have to put in in going from solid to liquid plus the amount of energy I put in in going from liquid to gas is equal to the amount of energy you need to go directly from a solid to a gas. This is another example of what we talked about last semester. Hess's law. Hess's law, remember, said it doesn't matter what path I take to go from point A to point B, all that matters is that I know the starting point and the ending point. And so in the case of solid to gas transition, it doesn't matter whether I think about it as a two-step process or a one-step process, the total energy change has to be the same. The other thing that has to be true is that all of these transitions occur at a constant temperature. If I look at that phase diagram and I pick a pressure, for example, one atmosphere of pressure, the temperature at which solid and liquid are in equilibrium is constant. If the temperature changes, then I'm either liquid or I'm solid, but I can't have both of them at the same time if the temperature is constant. So if I do a plot of temperature versus time, as long as I have a solid material, and we talked about this in calorimetry, the temperature can climb. At some point, the temperature will stay constant while I'm transitioning from solid to liquid material and then only after all of the liquid or all of the solid has melted can the temperature climb again. If I change the pressure, the temperature at which that occurs is going to change and every substance is going to be different. The other thing that is not obvious from this is that if you work a little bit harder, you find out that water's phase diagram is a little bit more complex than what we typically show you. We show you solids, liquids and gases, but solid up here has these other things that are also solids. They're different crystalline forms of water and every time I have a transition from one crystalline form to another, there's an equilibrium line that is going to be hold true for that transition. Kurt Vonnegut wrote a book called Cat's Cradle. You've read that one? Yes. And the premise of Cat's Cradle? Ice nine. Ice nine. 
If ice nine, the ninth solid phase of ice, were ever to be created, it would be the end of the world. Well, ice nine exists, and as far as I know, we're not at the end of the world yet. Here's ice nine here on this phase diagram. Um, so there are multiple crystalline phases. What that means is that you can get some really ugly looking phase diagrams. Here, I'm gonna blow this one up a little bit. They did for me, so. There's a, a, there's a, a blow up of the region between different phases of, different crystalline phases of ice. We're, don't worry, we're only gonna stick with one phase of water, one phase of most compounds. But there are times where we'll want to talk about I do consider Wikipedia to be a reasonable source, by the way. Not a great source, but a reasonable source. They have a nice composite phase diagram here that shows you in general that there are solids, liquids, and gases, a triple point, a critical point. There's an equilibrium line between the solid and the liquid, and that equilibrium line can either slope to the left or to the right. And the difference is whether or not the density of the solid is greater or less than the density of the liquid. So we have brought with us, thank you Matthew, some specially created supplies. This one is water, so we'll take some water here. Just to show you that this is indeed true. Turn on the power. Take the one labeled water, zoom that out, and put some cubes in it. And as you'd expect, they're ice cubes, they're frozen water, they float in the water. If we do the same thing now, with some cyclohexane, and they're melting quickly, so I had to do this quickly. We take some cubes of frozen cyclohexane, like I said, they're melting quickly, and I put them in, oh, that one's floating. <laughs> Can you see that back there, Matthew? This one's floating. These other two are down in the bottom. Why is that one floating, do you think? There's water in it. There's water in it? Well, we'll find out. Let's take a water cube. And if there's water in it, water should float in cyclohexane, right? So here's a frozen cube of water. It sinks like a rock. Good guess, but it's not because there's water in it. It ends up, the density of cyclohexane is less than the density of water. So cyclohexane will uh, float on water. Why did that one float? It's now dissolved, so it's completely gone. It probably had an air bubble trapped in it. When it melted, it got some air trapped in it. Now if I take one of these frozen cyclohexanes and put it in water, of course it will float because its density is less. But if I put it back in here, the, s the solid cyclohexane, which is more dense than the liquid, is going to sink right to the bottom. Water is somewhat unique. It ends up that any strongly hydrogen bonded compound is going to have a density of the solid that is less than the density of the liquid. If you haven't ever done it, now is the perfect time to do it. Go take a glass bottle of approximately uh, 12 ounce size and fill, I don't know where you'll find one of those, and fill it with some water and put it outside. Temperature's just the right right for that right now. If you've never tried it and watched what happens, it's the pressure that you can build up with water freezing is amazing. You can take a stainless steel bomb that's threaded or take a thermos jug, put some water in it, screw the cap on and put it outside and it will, ex it will blow the seams off of that stainless steel ball. Because the, as the water freezes and expands, there's enough pressure built up that it can overcome that even that strong a force. Um, you can, and most of the time it's done with an iron cylinder. I've, I'm still trying to buy one. I have to go out on eBay to find the right one. Cast iron piping. Cast iron piping. When, it, uh, when it freezes, the 
the same thing happens. Now, if I go down here, I want to show you a different kind of phase diagram. I have to put it up there, don't I? <laughs> that would help. This is a picture for all of you engineers in the audience that you will learn to love. This is the iron carbon phase diagram. So this is a mixture of iron with carbon. This is steel. And this phase diagram has to have slightly different scale markings on it. Where before we had pressure and temperature, now we're talking about a mixture of two solids. And so the x-axis now you'll see is labeled percent carbon. And we're looking at pretty small numbers, two, four, and six percent carbon. On the vertical axis we have temperature. And what we're seeing on this diagram is that at the juncture of these three lines, there are three phases in equilibrium, just like on the pressure temperature diagram we saw before. Any time you come to a point, you're going to have more than one phase in equilibrium with another. If there's a line, there are always two phases in equilibrium. So this line is the equilibrium between phase one and phase gamma plus one whatever gamma is. We're not going to worry too much about what that is. If they come to a point like this, there are, in this case there are one, two, three phases in equilibrium. All phase diagrams are going to be read that same way. If you come to a juncture where there's three lines coming together, you have three phases in equilibrium. If there's a line, there's, excuse me, two phases in equilibrium. There is a difference between vertical lines and horizontal lines. We're not going to worry too much about what they are. If I go back here, see if they give me the one I want. No, nope. I didn't do a search for this one. We'll see if Google's working for me today. Solder is the, s the material that is used in electrical circuits and, and for years now the electrical industry has been trying to figure out a way to eliminate lead from their solder. <coughs> what happens when I mix lead and tin or any two compounds together, over on this side of the diagram I have pure lead. The melting point of lead is 327 degrees. The axis here is percent tin, so on this side of the diagram I have pure tin. The melting point of pure tin is 232 degrees. When I mix the two of them together, the temperature at which the combination melts goes down. If I have predominantly lead, the temperature will be closer to the lead melting point. If I have predominantly tin, it will be closer to the tin melting point. And there is one composition, which happens to be 62 percent lead and 38 percent tin, where you get a minimum melting point. When you mix lead and tin in approximately a five, or a, a, what is that, six to four, thri three to two ratio, you get a mixture that melts at a very low temperature. Well, the nice thing about that low melting temperature, if you've ever soldered a circuit, is that once you melt it and you take the heat away, it then hardens again and you get a firm joint. The problem is that with lead, lead vapors, are not real good. They tend to cause quite a bit of brain damage. And so the electrical industry for years, electrical engineers after a fashion, go talk to some of them, have lead problems. They're, the, they're known for having degenerative disorders in their brains. Um, I don't know, never mind. Um, so if we could eliminate lead, the problem is they can't find a mixture that melts at a temperature because if you look at this, look at the temperature, it's 183 degrees C. 183 degrees C is really not that bad. Water boils at 100 degrees C, so a little bit higher than that's not a hard temperature to get to. So the whole electrical industry is trying to find a way to replace this. What you see happening here though, any time I mix one thing with another, I'm going to get a decrease, where's my bookmarks, there they are, 
in the temperature of the phase diagram. Nope, nice enough to give them to me. So, I want the simple one, I don't want this one. If I take water now and I put salt into it, add some sodium chloride to ice, what happens to the ice? It melts. Why does it melt? It lowers the freezing point. Why does it lower the freezing point? Anytime you put anything into another pure liquid, you will always lower the freezing point. Anytime you put anything into a liquid, you will always raise its boiling point. The question is, why does it do it? What's happening to cause the boiling point and the freezing point to change? It interferes with the bonds. It interferes with the bonds. You, it's a great concept. If we think about it, you take sodium chloride and you put it into water or put it onto ice, somehow the sodium chloride squiggles its way in between the water molecules. And so the hydrogen bonding that existed between those molecules is disrupted. And because you've disrupted the bonding, you've essentially caused it to melt. You no longer have an attractive force. That would be great. Except guess what? I can take sand and put it on ice and I will melt the ice because I will lower its freezing point. I can put crushed glass onto ice. Crushed glass is just sand and I will lower its freezing point. It's not because it disrupts the bonds, although that's a perfectly logical conclusion. Anybody else want to guess? I'll draw a picture that I've, I've drawn before. We'll see if you remember it. If I plot, if I measure the energy of every single particle in a container and I make a plot of the number of particles as a function of energy, I will always get a curve that looks something like that. And this value here, the average energy is, a, is the temperature. Temperature is simply a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles. If I raise the temperature, I'm just going to put this in for a second. I shift that curve. This is now at a higher temperature, but the total number of particles, the area under the curve, has to stay constant. I'm going to take that one out for a second. What happens if I've got ice and I plot this curve, it looks something like this, and now I add something to that mixture? Okay? I'm sorry? Let's assume they're at the same temperature. So I take ice that's at zero degrees C, or well, let's, let's make it cold, minus 10 degrees C, and I take sand or salt or crushed glass or whatever I've got at minus 10 degrees C and I mix them together so that it's not a thermal energy transfer. They're at the same temperature. So where they take more energy because more particles? Now there's more particles. And there's a distribution of energy of those particles, but that the distribution of energy is not going to shift when I add the particles, is it? But now there's more energy in the system. If there's more energy in the system just because I've added particles, what has to happen to get it to freeze? You have to take more energy out. By adding particles, whether they're at a different temperature or not, it doesn't matter, you're adding energy to the system. So if you want it to freeze, you have to take that energy back out. So I can add anything I want to water, to ice, and I can get it to melt just because those particles have energy. And so as soon as I dump them in there, and so if you've got ice and you want it to melt on the sidewalk, you can put salt on it, you can put sand on it, you can put crushed glass, and that is one of the things they put on it. Why would you pick one over the other then? We're going to get to environmental damage, but you're taking a step ahead of where I want to go, so I'm going to save that for you. Why would I pick sodium chloride over sand? 
Why would sodium chloride react faster? Not, well, it, it's more than polar, it's ionic. When I put sodium chloride into water, what happens? Well, here's my water molecule, and whether it's frozen water or liquid water doesn't matter. The molecules still have intermolecular forces of attraction. There's my water molecule. A sodium chloride comes along, happens to come in down here. What do we know? We know that this part of the molecule is positive, that part is negative. So the positive part of this molecule is going to attract what part of the sodium chloride? chloride. The chloride. It's going to rip the chloride away from the sodium. Now there's a loose sodium ion out there. Guess what? It gets attracted to another water molecule and I get sodium chloride to dissolve. So for every single particle of sodium chloride I put in there, how many particles have I really added to the system? Two, a sodium ion and a chloride ion. If I take silicon dioxide, sand or crushed glass, and I put it in here, silicon dioxide looks like this. I drew it wrong. Silicon dioxide is very much nonpolar. So when I put it into water, is it going to be attracted to the water? Yes, it will. Why? Because it still has dispersive forces of attraction. It's still going to be attracted to it. It has electrons, so there's still dispersion forces. They're just not going to be as strongly attracted. Will it rip the silicon dioxide apart? No, absolutely not. So when I put one particle of sand into the water, how many particles have I really put in? One. Go ahead, you're, you're going right where I want to go. If you put the same amount of sand and the same amount of salt in this, into the mixture, which one's going to have the greater effect? Salt, and how much greater? Twice as great because for every one particle of sodium chloride, I get two particles, sodium ion and chloride ion. Why would you use salt instead of sand? Twice the temperature lowering effect on ice. What if I used calcium chloride? CaCl2. That's even better because now I'm going to get three particles for every one particle of calcium chloride. I get a calcium ion and two chloride ions. So if you're the state of Ohio and you want to put stuff on the road to melt the ice, what are you going to pick? A mixture of sand and calcium chloride. A mixture of sand and calcium chloride is what the state of Ohio has chosen to use. Why not just calcium chloride? Well, actually all of those crystalline particles can provide traction if they don't completely dissolve, but the sand will provide some traction. So part of the reason the state of Ohio puts sand on is it does provide traction. It's cheaper. <laughs> Calcium chloride costs a lot. You get three times the effect from it, but it's really a financial decision. When you see that truck in front of you on the interstate that has that greenish colored liquid, that's a mixture of sand and calcium chloride, and they color it green so that nobody drinks it. I don't know why. <laughs> but they, you can put that on the road. You can put anything on the road and it will melt the ice. You could put molasses on the road and it would melt the ice. Is it safe for the environment? Is it safe for the environment? How many people have ever heard about salting the earth? What happens if you spread salt all over the fields? You kill all the plants. So is sodium chloride or calcium chloride, which is also a salt, good for our agricultural economy? No, not at all. But you could use fertilizer. We could just put ammonium nitrate all over the road. Why don't we put ammonium nitrate on the road? Because ammonium nitrate is a known oxidizer. It is explosive. Not a good idea. There is, however, a phenomenal thing that we could buy very cheaply that would be very good to lower the freezing point of the water and it would be good for the fields. It's called urea. <laughs> you could spread urea on the roads 
wait a second. Is there not a huge supply of urea that we could buy? Sure, every wastewater treatment plant in the country has excess urea. And it has no odor. Go get a bottle of urea and put your nose up properly and smell it. Urea does not have an odor. It has to be oxidized before it has an odor. And it doesn't get oxidized just in the air. It takes an acid to make it get oxidized. It is perfectly safe. It is a fertilizer, obviously. You can spread it on the fields already anyway. It's cheap. It's readily available. It has no odor. Why don't we use urea? Because everybody would say exactly what you just said. What do you mean? I'm putting human waste on the road so I can drive safely? Not a good idea. There, yeah, exactly. Um, Akron? No, not Akron. Somebody does use beet juice. North Dakota probably, since they grow so many beets up there. But beet juice is just sugar water. And they spread sugar water on the roads. It does exactly the same thing. Because when you mix these things together, there's my phase diagram for water. As soon as I mix a solid with a liquid, That's what happens to the solid liquid equilibrium line. It shifts downward. When it shifts downward, the triple point moves. So there's the liquid gas equilibrium line. So here's one atmosphere. Anytime you put anything into a pure liquid, you will shift this line down. You will shift the triple point down. When you shift the triple point down, if that's the normal freezing point, it's the freezing point at one atmosphere of pressure, that's the new freezing point. It's lower than it was before. That's the normal boiling point. It's the temperature at which atmospheric pressure and the vapor pressure of the compound are equal. That's the new boiling point. Notice it always goes up. Anytime you mix anything with a pure liquid, you will lower its freezing point and you will raise its freezing, excuse me, lower its freezing point and raise its boiling point. Always. So now here comes the $64,000 question. Why do you put salt in a pot of water before you cook macaroni? So it boils at a higher temperature. You, you know, and it cooks faster. Yes, it's a higher temperature, it would cook faster. Guess what? The reason you put salt into a pot of water to cook a macaroni is because we like the taste. The amount that it raises the boiling point is so small that it will not cook any faster. It would be great if it did, but it doesn't. It's, I, I set you up. I wanted you to say that. So by adding salt to a pot of water to cook pasta, you are not cooking it faster. You're just making it taste different because we like salt. It's one of our weaknesses. All right, I asked you a question at the end of class on Monday. How does ice skating work? And I know at least a half a dozen of you went and did a little Google research on it and said it has nothing to do with pressure. If I go back to this phase diagram, look at the pressures that are on this scale. They go all the way from one, atmos one pascal, one atmosphere is a kilopascal, so 10 to the third pascals, up to 10 to the ninth, six orders of magnitude. When you're standing on an ice skate, you are exerting a great deal of pressure on the ice. And so I'm going straight up that curve. Do you ever see me, as I increase the pressure, crossing over the solid liquid equilibrium line? No. I can go straight up that curve except for maybe in this one little region right here, where that curve shifts over enough. It is absolutely, completely 
false to say that the pressure you exert on the ice is why the ice melts and therefore you get a layer of water under you. The other thing, any hockey players in the room? One? Okay. You can all laugh at the hockey player in the room because he still skates on double runners. You know what double runners are? When I learned to skate, we had two blades. Every hockey player still skates on double runners because the way they sharpen the skates is not like that. That's not the bottom of the skate blade. They sharpen them like that. And again, everybody says it's because as you decrease the area, you increase the pressure, right? Pressure is, a, is the force per unit area. If I make a smaller area, I increase the pressure. By increasing the pressure, I melt the ice. No, no one quite understands why ice skating works other than it has something to do with friction and everybody says, wait a second, friction is just pressure. Well, yes, maybe. But the sharpened edges of the blades actually help you turn faster, which is why they skate, sharpen them this way. So it's, um, if anybody ever tells you, you that ice skating works because you're putting pressure, you're melting the ice, you just have to pull out a phase diagram and say, no, here's why that can't be true. <laughs> Friday, we're going to talk about concentration units. And here's your challenge for Friday. Why do I need a temperature independent concentration unit? And are all concentration units temperature independent? I will see you Friday. <laughs>